I spent about 20 years or so in the Australian Army, and I served in a variety of places like Indonesia, New Guinea, uh, Bougainville, East Timor. And as was mentioned, uh, along the way I did my PhD in the politics of Islamic insurgency. And so after 9-11, the Australian government kind of loaned me to the Americans for uh, a period to help with uh, developing strategy in what we used to call the global war on terrorism. I ended up working in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in the Horn of Africa, a variety of other very interesting places. Got out of government about five years ago and started a couple of different research and design firms. And what we do is different depending on where we work, but the common feature is that we're always trying to build partnerships with local communities to try to develop creative, sometimes counterintuitive ways to address the problems that really only they understand, and you have to build a partnership with the community to avoid the kinds of massive disruptions that give rise to issues like uh, the global war on terrorism. What I want to do today is talk a little bit about some of our work uh, in cities around the planet. Dramatic disruptive change in one generation or less. That's how Edgar Peters, the head of the Africa Center for Cities in Cape Town, describes what's happening to cities in the developing world today. We're looking at a crowded, coastal, highly urbanized, and highly connected planet. Let's put some numbers on that. The beginning of the Industrial Revolution in around the year 1750, the total population of the planet was only 750 million people. By 1900, that population had doubled to one and a half billion. By 1950, it had doubled again. By the end of the 20th century, it had doubled yet again. So we're at six billion people on the planet. And in just a dozen or so years since then, we've added more than a billion people. So today, the population is about 7.1 billion people. And if you look again on the slide, you'll see that at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, only about 2% of people lived in a city of a million or more. By 1900, it's 10%. By 1960, it's 25%. Today, it's just slightly north of 50%. And the projection, which you see at the bottom of the slide, is that by the middle of this century, we'll have a total global population of about 9.5 billion, of whom 75%, that's the same population as the entire planet today, will be living in urban environments. Now, that city development is not evenly spread. It's overwhelmingly concentrated on coastlines in the developing world, the global south, as we sometimes call it. Cities that lack the infrastructure and, in many cases, the resources to handle the pace and scale of urban growth that they're experiencing. A new factor, though, has really come into play in the last decade. Everything we've just been talking about, as the figures I just showed you demonstrate, has been coming on for about 200 years. But look at this. This is the rooftop of a slum called La Rocinha, a favela outside of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Look at the satellite dishes the cell phone antennas, the TV aerials. This is a highly connected, networked environment. And this is a new phenomenon. It's only happened in the last 10 years or so. Again, we can put some numbers on this. Today, we've got about 7 billion people, as I said, on the planet, of whom about 2.5 billion are internet users. Roughly 6.5 billion people have cell phones. That's about 93% of the total population on the planet, about 1.8 are active social media users, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. And that contrasts with only about four and a half billion people who actually have a toilet or access to clean running water or sanitation. So right now, out there somewhere is about two billion people talking on cell phones without access to clean water or sanitation. Again, this is a new phenomenon. What we've been talking about in terms of urbanization and population growth has been coming for two centuries. This is new. And it's very heavily affecting the same areas, coastal cities in the developing world. This is uh, one of those cities which I'm a little familiar with. This is Mogadishu in Somalia. Uh, I took this photograph in June of 2012 when African Union peacekeepers, you can see them on the right of the photograph there, had just captured the city from Al-Shabaab, which is the local Al-Qaeda franchise uh, in that part of Africa. Mogadishu is a city that's experienced civil war for about two decades. But actually, it's a pretty awesome place to do business. It has a very dynamic business culture, great restaurant scene. It's got some awesome beaches, nice cafes. And it's actually the hub of a really important trading network that goes down into East Africa, 
across into the rest of Africa. And because of access to the Somali diaspora, which is nearly a million people, it connects to Australia and the UK and the United States and Canada and Western Europe. It's a really important hub for both licit and illicit trading of commodities around the planet. This is the Bakara market, um, which some of you may have heard that name because it was the scene of the Black Hawk Down battle about 20 years ago between American Rangers and uh, Somali militia. Today, it's a currency trading exchange. These guys are trading the Somali shilling, which is a currency that survived for 20 years without a state or a central bank, but it floats freely on international exchange rates. The way that it does that is these guys go online five times a day with their Android phones or onto the internet to sites like xc.com or Currency Calculator app. They figure out the current exchange rate of the Somali shilling and they punch out an SMS text message to about a thousand traders working across Mogadishu who trade with the global diaspora and the international economy. Again, obvious point, this would not have been possible as little as five to ten years ago and it's consumer electronic communication technology that's enabling not only the rapid urban growth of a place like Mogadishu, but rapid economic growth. The downside is the planet is becoming a planet of slums. As Mike Davis, this guy from uh, Hawaii, who's a famous uh, urban theorist, has pointed out, cities are growing into each other, and the open space among cities is being filled in with informal settlements, uh, something that Ricky Burdett, who's a uh, arch uh, architect in the UK, calls the endless city. Already this, the area from Sao Paulo to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil is a single giant conurbation of about 43 million people. And we see similar strips of sort of city clusters emerging in coastal areas in East Africa, uh, in West Africa, in East Asia, and in India. In this area, we're starting to see a phenomenon that some people call internal secession, where elites are starting to opt out of cities that are overstretched. So in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, for example, every year there are 75,000 private helicopter journeys where people that have the money live in gated communities with private security and privatized resources, and they commute by helicopter flying over the top of this overstretched slum environment to their offices and back again. Now, the military and aid agencies and diplomatic services have been doing this in war zones for years. This is me, uh, a little younger, but unfortunately no better looking a few years ago, coming off a helicopter uh, in the Cordillera Central of Colombia. The way the military operates is they fly from green zone to green zone. Now we're finding civilian elites in a normal peacetime environment doing the same thing. And just as elites are opting out, people at the bottom of the pyramid are being excluded. This is Makoko, which is a major slum. It's about 100 years old, has a population of about 250,000 in the lagoon that gives Lagos its name uh, in Nigeria. This is an urban no-go area. There's no government services, no police presence, no government uh, presence really at all, and it's now become an area that's controlled by so-called area boys or non-state gang groups. The government began demolishing large parts of this area uh, a couple of years ago as part of building new settlements like this, which is one of these kind of elite level uh, gated communities. So we're starting to see this process of internal secession pull urban societies apart. And I think that's something that everybody in this room should be worried about, because it's this kind of exclusion and keeping people out of access to economic prosperity and social development that gives rise to these massive kinds of disruptions that we've just been dealing with uh, in the global war on terrorism. What we do on the ground is we work with communities to try to make them more resilient. And this is one of our teams working in a, a slum in Liberia. We work to try to make communities harder to push around both for the government and police and corrupt officials, but also for local non-state gang groups and others. And in this case, what we've been doing is working with a community uh, of women's groups to understand where the women in this particular area felt at risk and under threat. And so what we did was we built a collaborative mapping software. It's free and open source called First Mile Geo, which people can use to pull the information that they have about their environment, to understand their environment and see it in a way that they may not have been able to do before, and then to come up with some creative ideas about how to address problems like risk of crime and violence in such a way that they don't have to let more police or more military into their environment. Because in a lot of these places, more cops in your district is just more opportunities to get shaken down. What we do as we work with communities is something that's called participatory development, or co-design. 
it puts the leadership role on the local community where they have the vision, they seek to identify what to do in their environment, and all we do is provide just a little bit of technical support to help them do that. And we've successfully done this, and we're not the only ones. There's a lot of other little startups and tech companies doing the same thing. We've done this in places like big slum areas in Africa, but also uh, in Syria. This is uh, the largest city in Syria, Aleppo, one of the most dangerous cities on the planet. We spent about a year working with communities to understand where they're most at risk, where the aid is getting through and where it's not, and where the humanitarian crisis is at its worst. We've also worked in a number of very heavily crime-infested places in South and Central America, all of which have the same phenomenon, rapid urban growth, rapid uh, population size growing, cities overstretching, but connectivity resources that allow you to pull together this kind of technology-enabled solution to help communities understand their own priorities and what they need to do about it. And we've even got uh, a number of NGOs in Somaliland now, in the north of Somalia, working with our tool to try to figure out how to understand conflicts over resources in these large urban areas. Now, 20 years ago, when I did my PhD, we used to have what I would call a sort of classic social anthropology model, where you would spend years studying somebody else's society, understanding their culture, learning the language. You put on a funny hat like this guy, and you would travel to their society, and you'd produce some kind of ponderous academic tome with a title like The Sexual Life of Savages in Northwest Melanesia. This is actually a real book. It was written in 1929 by Bronislaw Malinowski, one of the founders of modern anthropology. Now, my point is, apart from being just a little bit neocolonialist, this kind of thing turns out to be not at all necessary anymore. Because now, in all these slum environments, in these informal settlements, in large overstressed cities, there are literally hundreds of bloggers, of community television and radio stations, of citizen journalists, of local tech startups, design firms that are all working to understand their own environment, to communicate with each other what's going on in their own local language or in many cases in English, and to understand what's actually uh, the set of priorities that they need to be addressing. And this, to me, is where the hope lies in everything that I've been talking about. Because we're not only talking about a rapidly growing urban population that has the potential to overstretch cities in the next generation, we're also talking about new technology and new capabilities as a result of consumer electronics that are out there now flooding the developing world that allow cities and communities to understand themselves in ways they were never able to before to generate the kind of consensus around problems of urban overstretch, of crime, poverty, sanitation, and so on, and to come up with that participatory development or co-design approach that allows them to think about the sort of how might we do differently what we need to do in our environment in order to make it more resilient. And that, I think, is uh, what may potentially unlock the adaptive resources that places like Lagos or Dhaka in Bangladesh uh, or other cities that are rapidly growing, those resources that they need to cope with this future of coastal, crowded, connected cities. Thanks for listening.